It's uh, noon here on the U.S. East Coast, and um, I'm going to welcome everybody to our final NED Talk of November's NOAA Data Fest celebration, just one week away from Thanksgiving. This year for NOAA Fest, we've been focusing about learning about data from both geostationary and polar low Earth orbiting satellites. In honor of the two upcoming launches next year, we are actually, NOAA is launching both a geostationary and a polar satellite, uh, two launches, two orbits, one mission. These uh, two satellites work together to provide critical data for weather forecasts and for environmental situational awareness, as we already know. And in fact, two of our panelists today have uh, returned to join us again. Dan Lindsay, who uh, talked about the many uses of geo, geostationary satellite data, and Jorel Torres, who talked about the JPSS program and how we use low earth orbit satellite data uh, presented earlier this month. We have those recordings available on your uh, NED Talk panel here. Uh, you'll see that there's a, in the bottom left corner, there's a couple of links there. Uh, one is for, to open a separate window with captions. You can also open captions by clicking on the closed captioning button up in the top if anybody needs that. And uh, the other link that's down there in the lower uh, left corner is the Net Talks archive where you can go in and see those previous recordings. So, um, you know, today we're not planning on, there, there's not going to be any presentations today. It's uh, it's going to be a, a bit less formal than our previous two Ned Talks. And uh, it's going to be a more fun, casual, and interactive conversation that we're going to have today. But one thing that I want to do before we start is I just want to clearly um, make the separation between those two orbits that we're talking about. The geo or geostationary orbit is that is an orbit that has a uh, period rotation that matches the rotation of the Earth. Uh, its orbit matches the rotation of the Earth at almost 36, 36,000 kilometers, which is 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. And that's uh, uh, right above the Earth's equator. And this allows the satellite to hover continuously over one position over the surface of the Earth and always take that imagery from that vantage point. The other satellite orbit that we're going to be, that we're talking about is the low Earth orbit, or we refer to it also as the polar orbit. And um, each polar satellite, uh, polar orbiting satellite completes roughly 14 orbits per day around the Earth going nearly over the North and South Pole. And, um, you know, those are much closer to the Earth. Those are, are uh, at 800 kilometers, 520 miles above the surface of the Earth. So the, the two orbits are, are clearly different, right? And for details, as I mentioned on what kind of products and things you can get from each one of them, please don't hesitate to visit those archived net talks. But at this time, I, I want to... Uh, introduce to the panel, Dan Lindsay. Go ahead, please, Dan. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Dan Lindsay. I'm the Gozar Program Scientist, and uh, hopefully you were able to make my talk last week. If not, uh, as Rafa said, there is a link in the lower left and you can take a look at it. So I look forward to helping answer some of your questions a little bit later, thanks. Thanks, Dan. And the other, uh, Dan is representing GEO, if you may, the geostationary satellite orbits. The representative for the low, for NOAA's low Earth orbiting satellites is Jorel Torres. Jorel, please go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Thanks, Rafa. As Rafa mentioned, my name is Jorel Torres, and I work at the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, or CIRA, which is located in Fort Collins, Colorado. I am a JPSS satellite liaison, essentially working between our National Weather Service or NWS user community um, and working between them and also the research community focusing on JPSS products, applications, and also very importantly, the development of satellite training resources for our users. And, uh, uh, and uh, I hope that you were able to attend my talk back in, on November 5th. And uh, I know Rafa has the links for that. Thank you so much, Cheryl. 
That was perfect. So having presented our previous presenters, now I'm going to introduce our other two panelists who are probably going to do, be doing a lot of the talking today. Uh, we've went through uh, all different folks and uh, offices around NOAA and found a couple of folks who can talk about how those two orbits come together in their everyday work. And um, these two folks are Carl Jones and Mike Pavlonis, and I'm going to let them introduce each other themselves and um, talk a little bit about how they use both the low Earth orbit polar satellite data and the geostationary data in their everyday work. And we're going to start with Carl. Carl, please go ahead. All right. Thank you, Rafa. Yeah, uh, my name is Carl Jones. I'm a National Weather Service meteorologist at the uh, Weather Service office in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, and as far as uh, I've been there for about two going on three years, so relatively new to uh, the National Weather Service, but um, I've been uh, in my meteorological career for uh, probably somewhere between seven and ten-ish years. Um, and so, it, you know, using satellites and as far as uh, what I do for my work and within my career um, didn't just start within the National Weather Service. It started well, well before then. Um, and uh, both the use of the GEO and LEO satellites um, have been in incredibly helpful um, in, in many different ways. Um, I guess one particular way, probably the most obvious way, is um, there, you know, it significantly aids in the, the in assessing the current state of the atmosphere. Um, you know, that's uh, that's basically through the use of um, analyzing imagery and and the, uh, the other different types of products that um, might come from um, the analysis of or the through the imagery um, kind of processed by um, the the platforms themselves or the alg algorithms that are. Um, using that uh, imagery, um, you know, to make a better forecast, essentially. We're, we're looking at these, uh, this current state of the atmosphere, um, applying our knowledge, our conceptual models um, of, from what we know that the atmosphere and how it behaves, as well as using um, uh, the addition or the aid of um, numerical weather prediction models and kind of using those two to combine um, to try to come up with a best and most accurate forecast of how the atmosphere is going to behave, whether it's uh, in the nearest term, within the hour, the next, uh, you know, day or even long term uh, between that, uh, you know, seven to 10 days beyond. Um, and a little bit uh, more indirectly, um, and I, I believe this was already talked about within the uh, previous NED talks, is how the satellite data really serves as the, um, like I, you saw the word, the backbone of uh, the numerical weather prediction models. Um, so in that sense, you know, we're, we're kind of using satellite data in a, in a twofold kind of a way, both using the imagery, um, applying our, our knowledge and concepts um, to make it, as well as using the numerical weather prediction models um, to help aid um, in making a most accurate forecast for um, the part, our, our, the public, as well as our partners within the National Health Service. Thank you, Carl. And now I'll ha hand it over to Mike. Mike, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and also give us a bit of background on how you use each one of the satellite orbits in your work? Absolutely. Thank you, Rafa, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. So I'm Mike Pavlonis. I'm with the NOAA uh, Center for Satellite Applications and Research. I'm a physical scientist there. I'm actually physically stationed at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. It's one of the NOAA Cooperative Institutes, the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies. Um, my background's in meteorology and I've been doing satellite applications for, for over 20 years. And um, I both orbits, rely on both orbits, work on a variety of applications over the years including severe weather, um, volcano monitoring and remote sensing, and volcanic, volcanic hazard mitigation, on fires a bit, 
So, you know, in, in my experience, you know, both of these orbits are absolutely critical. And, and in the end, you know, we're, we're trying to turn this torrent of, you know, uh, data into actionable information. That's really the grand challenge. So take all of the data from these, these various platforms in, in both orbits and turn it into something that's actionable for users like Carl, who have, are in the hot seat, have to make decisions, have to work with their core partners to help them make decisions. It's all part of this value chain. And so I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have here and answering any questions that the, uh, the attendees may have and, and looking forward to it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Mike. And you know, one uh, question that I'm going to dive in here with, um, it has to do with the positioning of both the satellites. And, and Mike, I, I think I'm going to ask you maybe to let me know, uh, uh, you know, because geostationary satellites are located above the equator, um, it's probably hard for them to get good views of maybe some of the some of the volcanoes you might be monitoring. So I I wanted to ask you, you know, how uh, how much do you use uh, polar versus geo for that specific application? You really do need both orbits to to get a complete picture. Um, you know the, the the combination of near constant observations that you get from geo and the higher definition data provided by low earth orbit data. So higher definition, more pixels, you know, it's like having that, that clearer image, you know, it's, you know, from, from, you know, just looking at a photograph. Uh, it also, we, we sample the electromagnetic spectrum in more regions that gives us more information in the low earth orbit. Uh, so the combination of near continuous observation and, and these higher definition properties, it, it really is needed. Um, you know, there are some features at volcanoes that are, are really, really small and difficult to see from the geostationary perspective. So that's where the low Earth orbit comes in. Um, there, it, you know, volcanic eruptions are one of the most rapidly evolving natural phenomena. So the, the time re resolution, the number of images, the sampling we get from geostationary, I mean, that, that's, that's just a critical... If we didn't have that in the toolkit, you know, that we, we wouldn't be able to react to, to new eruptive events the way that we can. It, it really is a game changer. Um, but the combination of the two is you can't live, you, you can't have one and live without the other. You really do need one. Thank you very much. And um, Carl, I, I did want to ask you very quickly, as far as your um, geographic extent, area of interest, if you may, could you tell, talk to us a little bit about that geographic area of interest and maybe where, uh, maybe perhaps you didn't get the coverage you wanted from one of the satellite orbits? Yes, uh, for the most part, the contiguous United States is pretty well covered by the, the geo um, satellites. Um, so as you know, being the national in the National Weather Service, we're we're pretty well covered um, by both the operational geo um, satellites up that are currently in operations. Um, however, uh, you know, the further you get on the edge, so to speak, or the edge of this field of view for each of the satellites, you start to lose a little bit of uh, spatial definition, as well as things um, start to or features start to get a little maybe more distorted, so to speak, um, um, in terms of like uh, how uh, what parallax might do to uh, uh, geolocating um, particular areas of interest. Um, so being up, uh, you know, basically neighbors with Canada, we're kind of getting towards that edge or I personally for my particular um, area of responsibility um, in North Dakota, um, we, we tend to um, have to so we have to take that into account um, through uh, the, the geostationary um, or the geo uh, imagery that we look at. And um, it, it although we're very um, fortunate to have the coverage that we do, um, it's just something that we are kind of used to, I guess, at the moment to, to kind of keep in mind that we are a little bit uh, maybe more on the edge as opposed to uh, maybe in the edge of the field of view, as opposed to our neighbors to the south, who might be a little bit um, more underneath the uh, the center of the eye of the field of view, if you will, of these geo uh, satellites. But that's where the Leo satellites can help, um, and and really help uh, specify which um, area of interest that we are looking for. And, and 
for, I guess, for instance, if we're looking at a fire um, and we're monitoring a fire, uh, there's these uh, these hot spots, so to speak. You know, there's these thermal signatures that these fires put um, bring out, um, and both satellites can detect them very well. Um, however, uh, you know, there might be a little bit of uh, um, coarseness or maybe some parallax. Not, I guess, not a whole lot with the fire and, um, example, but there's is maybe still just a little bit, especially if you have terrain. Um, uh, it's into, within the uh, field of view of the geo satellites. However, if you get a pass from the LEO satellite, you can get a, a much more clear picture as to um, you know the bounds of this particular fire, um, as well as the location, the exact location of this fire. And this is you know something that core partners are really really looking for, um, especially if they're having a hard time trying to. Uh, you know, assess where the location of the, maybe the hottest or the most intense part of this fire might be. Um, so while, again, you know, Mike had alluded to the uh, the timeliness um, of, uh, of volcanoes and monitoring volcanic uh, eruptions and, and the hazards associated with them using the geo satellites, you know, the, that same application can be applied uh, to fires and, and many other uh, hazards that we monitor. Um, However, that the LEO um, satellites really help provide a more uh, crisp and, and I guess cleaner picture without room for error in terms of at least uh, locating where you're, what hazard you might be looking for. Um, so as far as the, uh, you know, going back to your question, the, 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 the geographic uh, um, the scope of the, uh, the satellites that are out there, right, that we have to use. Um, you know, in, in the United States, we're sitting pretty, or at least the contiguous United States, we're, we're, we're sitting pretty good um, in terms of the geo um, coverage. But if you start getting maybe a little bit closer towards the poles, um, or maybe on, you know, the edges, uh, you know, within the, the, the Pacific and Atlantic, um, might not be uh, so lucky. Um, but that's where the, the LEO satellites can really help um, you know, fill in those those gaps, I suppose. That was great. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. One, you know, related with the latency, uh, there is a fun question that we received. Um, it The question specifically says, if you were to have a satellite receiving station, which orbit would you like to get data from and why? Now, the the question doesn't, uh, mean that you you have to choose just one. I think maybe this question is more like if if you could get, uh, you know, have a satellite uh, receiving station and produce products in like near real time or real time as they're happening, which one of the two satellites would you choose over the other one, assuming that you eventually would get access to all the products from both orbits? And that's a question for you, Carl. Okay, so uh, just for uh, the, the the question is to which axis, which orbit are we? Uh... Let me repeat it. So okay, the, sorry. the question is if if you were to have a satellite receiving station, which orbit would you want to get data from, and why? And um, again, this the, I. The question isn't excluding that you would eventually get data from all orbits, but let's just talk about like that latency part of things. If you wanted to get like the, the fastest data, the, the first uh, data on your day-to-day -day work, which from which orbit would you want that data to come from? Uh, I would probably have to, uh, <laughs> I guess, put my vote towards the geo. Um, especially, you know, it has that capability of bringing you information in the most timely manner, um, bringing uh, near real time information. So the quicker we can get, uh, you know, information as to what's actually happening right now at this point in time, um, I think that'll lead to a quicker response in our, um, you know, uh, information that we can pass on to our core partners and then as well as making the forecast. So I'm going to throw my vote towards the geo orbit. I like it. I'll take it. And I'm going to bring that question now to Mike. Mike, if you could let us know if you had to choose, like, 
which orbit you would like to get the closest to real time satellite data because you had your own receiving station, which one would you choose? Well, well I can't argue with, with what Carl said, but you know, so sort of in practice, you know, the geostationary data are kind of broadly available in your real time already. The low Earth orbit data, if you have your own receiving station, you can get the latency much, much lower on that. So just as a matter of, you know, practical matter, I think, I think being able to receive the low Earth orbit data at a much lower latency than, than you may otherwise, there's a, there's a lot of assuming that the geo is, is already being distributed more broadly in your real time than I would. Um, but if, 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 you know, you had to choose sort of the, uh, whether or not you're getting geo at low latency or Leo at low latency, I think, you know, you want both, but if you had to choose, I'd say you want probably geo in most instances, unless you're at the really high latitudes. Um, and it depends on your application, but I think you could have both. And, and it, I, I think having a, a Leo receiving station help closes the gap between the, the latency that you see from geo and Leo. Thank you. Great answer. And um, Mike, I've, I've noticed that you did uh, in the chat here that we have between presenters, you mentioned that you can follow up with some thoughts on fire applications. I, I want to open it up for you to do that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rafa. So yeah, just building on what Carl had, had, had said about the difference between Leo and Geo for fire. So just to give you some perspective. So the Geo, again, is this near constant surveillance. But the trade-off for that is, is, is a, a bit of a higher... Uh, degraded spatial resolution. So in order, let's say, just take the Western United States. In order to detect a fire reliably in the Western United States from geo, it needs to be about the size of, say, like a basketball or a tennis court, something like that. Um, but in LEO, you can detect fires that are about the size of a kitchen or dining room table, um, but you're not getting the near constant surveillance of it. So, you know, there, there, there's this, this synergy here between these two orbits um, that, that, you know, really works well. And, and, and again, you know, the fires vary in size and you want to catch them as early as possible. They vary in temperature and things that factor into how you can detect them from satellite. So having both satellites that, that have the, the different attributes, you couldn't, you can't really tackle that problem without both of those orbits. Very good. Thank you very much. And, Mike, I, I have a question for you, and and I and this is a question that I might open up uh, also to our previous presenters, to Jorel and to Dan. But Mike, I, I want to start with you. Do you do you have an example of a product or algorithm that uses both geostationary and polar orbiting satellite data as inputs? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there's 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 several of them. You know, for our for volcano monitoring, you know, that's work that my group does. So I'm very familiar with it. We we rely on both orbits um, for you know to to sort of get complete detection of new volcanic events and be able to track hazardous volcanic clouds effectively, as they you know they they can they can be dispersed very long distances from the source volcano and they're a major hazard to aviation. So volcanic ash in the atmosphere. Gases like sulfur dioxide are, are harmful to human health, and they can they can be transported really long distances, thousands and thousands of miles away from the source volcano, and, and be in the atmosphere for days or longer. Um, so having having a constellation of geo satellites along with the Leo satellites allows us to track those clouds, and you know it allows the aviation sector to manage that hazard, stay out of it, and and minimize the disruptions. Uh, so that's really critical. Fires, I, I mentioned that already. You know, you really do need both orbits um, to to do that, and 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 those are extensively used. Um, but you could think of things like flood mapping. That's a recent success of, of using both orbits to you know find the extent of of, of flooded flooded areas. Um, you know, in hurricane uh, analysis and intensity forecasting or, or intensity analyses. It's, it's both orbits are really used. So, you know, severe weather, coral reef monitoring, air quality, you know, you could go on about all of these things, but it really is there. there it's hard to, the, the, maybe the other question would be, okay, what application don't you need both orbits? Because I think, I think for most of them you do. Well said. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to open up that question a little bit to uh, Jarrell, if you have anything to add to what Mike just said. Yeah, uh, uh, for, 
the things I think about too, where GOES and JPSS can work together. Um, and as Mike was saying, you know, you have the similar, um, you have some similar uh, spectral channels, uh, individual channels, products, and or RGBs. Well, one thing I'll highlight, Mike was mentioning fires. I think of like the uh, fire RGBs. So you have like your GOES, uh, like for example, you have a GOES fire temperature RGB and a GOES dayland cloud fire RGB, or yeah, dayland cloud fire RGB, which then you also have your VIRS versions. Now for users or the general public here that are unfamiliar with these RGBs, they can be employed to observe your fire location, observe your fire smoke aspects, observe your fire perimeter, fire aerial extent, um, and then also be sensitive to like, say your vegetation health, say like burn scars, for example. But where you can utilize both GOES and LEO, of course with GOES, you have that higher temporal resolution at one minute, five minute or 10 minute uh, temporal resolution. And then with the Polar Orbiter VIRS data sets, of course it's not as timely. You're only gonna get two overpasses uh, or at least two overpasses a day. Um, and that'll be coming one from SMPP and one from NOAA 20 in the afternoon. And then, and then also you'll get those in the uh, nighttime overpass as well. Uh, but the point is with your LEO data sets, you have that high spatial resolution that could come in and uh, uh, get a more detailed uh, perspective of the fire uh, compared to the coarser, um, uh, coarser spatial resolution of GOES, although GOES has that higher temporal resolution. Um, and then you're also mentioning uh, the concept of latency and for users that are unfamiliar with the latency aspect, uh, it's the pretty much the, um, you have the satellite overpass, the time difference between your satellite overpass to when that uh, imagery is observed in your, uh, well, for National Weather Service forecasters, it's their AWIF system or a forecasting and software analysis package that they can view the satellite imagery along with like radar, surface observations and other data sets. Uh, and for LEO data sets, um, uh, the, what, what we're talking about briefly is trying to get, trying to reduce that latency. And so ideally from SMPP and NOAA 20, uh, that latency, generally speaking, is usually between an hour and hour and a half. Uh, but if you have access to what we call a direct broadcast antennas, um, uh, it, that latency is reduced to about 30 minutes. So, and that can be helpful for our users such as Carl Jones and all uh, the forecasters across the contiguous US um, with um, utilizing those data sets in near real time. But that's what I want to mention there. Thanks, Jerome. That was great. And yeah, I'm going to now bring this question over to Dan. Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, thanks, Rafa. Um, Everybody has done a really good job of answering this, but I, I thought I would provide sort of a specific example of a way in which the combined use of the data is is extremely helpful in some circumstances. So let's say that the problem at hand is we're trying to figure out the, the warmth of the ocean. We call that the sea surface temperature um, in an area, say, near the coast, uh, a coast of the U.S., say, well, let's call it the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is important because hurricanes Feeds, they quote unquote feed on the warm ocean water. So it's important to know how warm the ocean is, how cold it is, and sort of the gradients or the ranges of this as you approach the coast. Let's say that's what we're trying to do. Now, we are capable of doing this retrieval of, of figuring out the sea surface temperature from both GEO and LEO. We do have the, the spectral information to do that. However, we can't generally do it very well through clouds. So any area that is persistently cloudy um, and as the satellite is looking down and they see clouds, they don't see the ocean. So we can't really do the retrieval in that, in that situation. So here's how um, we solve that problem with GEO plus LEO. The LEO, as they come over, say a couple times a day, are able to do the retrieval only in the clear areas at really high resolution. But the GEO can, are, is sitting there watching in a constant manner and they, it's watching the clouds move with time. So as the clouds move out of the way, we can do the retrieval sort of in between the clouds. And, and if you think about doing that over say a one day period or a two day period, you build up a larger area of clear pixels of areas where we can actually do the retrieval. So after a day or after two days, we can then make a map of where it was clear when the LEO passed over high resolution sea surface temperature 
but we can also fill in some of those gaps, uh, not quite as high resolution, but we can then get the sea surface temperature from geo as well. So this, this cloud clearing thing I'm describing applies not only to sea surface temperature, but it applies to flood monitoring. Say, I remember after Hurricane Harvey made landfall in Texas a few years ago, widespread, right, widespread flooding, the clouds did stick around, but with a combined geo Leo, we were able to map out where that flooding was occurring and send that information over to FEMA um, for them to do some of their uh, uh, post-storm, um, uh, um, you know, sort of really helping with the post-storm uh, situation. So uh, hopefully that was clear. Thanks. It was, yes. And and I get it. You're combining the best of both worlds, right? The um, very high resol spatial resolution that you can obtain from polar orbiting satellites that orbit closer to the Earth with the very high temporal resolution from geostationary satellites that are hovering and looking at the same part of the Earth just from a, a, a much greater distance, basically, right? That's wonderful. And a great application, by the way. Um, you know, we've we've had a couple of questions come in while we were um, while we were talking from our audience, and uh, I want to bring I want to bring one of those questions in. It's it's coming from Mordechai Cohen, and um, he is wondering uh, if Geo or Leo um, NOAA polar satellites have synthetic aperture radars that produce data that can be used. So Dan Jarrell, do, uh, do, do we have synthetic aperture radars on any of those orbits? Hi, Rafa, I'll chime in. I know we have um, SAR data sets from uh, Sentinel and RadarSat2 satellites and uh, provide a, so from, a variety of different data sets. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, so from not NOAA satellites, but we do use um, synthetic aperture radar satellite data from other providers. Is that right? That's my understanding. Okay. Go, please continue with your uh, description. I just wanted to make that distinction. Uh, I was just going to give an. Uh, I was just going to give an example of like say this uh, synthetic aperture radar, uh, like wind data sets that you can utilize for like observing say tropical cyclones and wind the observe the wind uh, maxima within those storms and how the high winds can affect um, whether it be uh, onshore or offshore, um, you know, offshore for like uh, maritime users or people, uh, you know, uh, on boats or uh, fishing industries, so on and so forth. And then of course, onshore, the onshore impacts when these tropical cyclones make landfall. But, um, but yes, uh, coming from radar sat two and sentinel satellites. Low Earth orbiting satellites that are not NOAA satellites, and as far as we know, geostationary satellites do not have this type of capability. Is that right, Dan? Um, that's correct, to the best of my knowledge. I can say for sure that the NOAA geostationary satellites do not have synthetic aperture radar. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that none of our international partners and other groups have that either, but I can't say that with 100% certainty. Yeah. It's, it's an assumption based on the fact that synthetic aperture radar satellites are active uh, sensors that emit a pulse, right? And you normally are, pro probably the technology is where you, the satellite needs to be closer to the earth. But as we said, we're not 100% sure about that. Um, the same, per uh, you know, I want to remind everybody to please take the opportunity to ask your questions in the, in the questions and answers box below. And, um, you know, we did receive another question also from Mordechai, but he submitted this one via uh, the internet, via our social media channels. We've been asking folks to send their questions there. And we want to thank Mordechai for, for following us and being on all our uh, different chats. But his question on social media is, at what point in development do STAR algorithms transfer over to being used in OSPO operations. Now I'm gonna just to be clear, at what point in development do STAR, STAR is the uh, uh, NOAA satellites 
uh, remote sensing research branch, if you may. And OSPO is uh, uh, an acronym for the Office of Satellite and Product Operations. It's, it's operations, right? So I think more of the Chai's question is like, at what point when something is being researched, uh, you know, by our scientists on, at STAR, uh, looking at remote sensing app, uh, data applications, at what point, part does that transfer over to being used in operations? And um, I'm going to, uh, you know, do any of you have an answer for this question? I'm going to open it up to the full panel to see if anybody wants to chime in. I can I can start. I've gone through this this process a number of times in, in my career. So, you know, in NOAA we do have a a sort of readiness scale that that products follow. So early on, you're doing sort of basic applied research or applied research that that is immature. You develop a capability. Um, that capability matures to the point where you can start to demonstrate it with your user community and get their feedback. And if, you know, through those, those user interactions and more formal evaluations and things we call proving grounds or test beds, um, where you provide this product in a non-operational environment, but, it's, but it sort of simulates an operational environment. And, you know, if, if the feedback from users is, yes, this is going to help us accomplish something in our operational workflow or our decision-making, at that point, it would it would go forward as, as something that you would recommend as a transition to operations. And there's all sorts of considerations, cost, benefit, all of those things as, as you would expect. But you know, it is it is a sort of evolution through this scale. It can take anywhere from depending on, on how long it takes to develop a capability. It it could go as fast as a couple of years. It can be it can be longer uh, depending on, on on the capability and, and how quickly it comes together. Uh, but I know Dan and, and Jarrell have a, uh, and have a lot of uh, experience with this as well. Thank you, Mike. Dan, Jarrell, do you do you have any additional comments on this? You know, I think Mike really spelled it out very well um, of, of the process it takes. Um, and you know that we we like to test things in operations before we actually make them uh, truly operational and hand them over to OSPO or the the operational branch of NESDIS. Um, and I, I think the process works relatively well uh, where, you know, it's sort of star in the development and testing. And then um, once it's, we sort of, we so-called throw it over the fence over to OSPO to, uh, to run it in real time. Thank I'll you, also mention that the, um, oh, sorry, Rafa. Uh, I'll, I'll just also mention, you know, it's a, I would say from my perspective, it's, you know, definitely uh, a complex process and also involves the R2O or the research to operations, operations to research aspect as well, where you're, say you have a, a researcher that has a new product that they want to utilize or that they want users to employ, uh, say for fire monitoring for just as a case example. And then, you know, it goes through the proper channels and then we get uh, to the, I'd say the display part like say an ellipse kind of thing, like how does it look? C can users uh, interpret it quickly? Um, how useful is it? And you get that, the, the key feedback from our National Weather Service forecasters to help fine tune, um, you know, the imagery and the aesthetic point of view um, to help improve um, those data sets. And then eventually um, these data sets become operational in the end. But my point is, you know, it's a collective feedback from not only the, the research point of view, but then also very importantly, our users and uh, just to help get the maximum information from our products. So, but that's what I wanted to say there. That was great. Thank you. And, um, you know, I have another question here. This one's a, a little bit oriented towards national service. So Carl, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, send this question to you, although of course any other, uh, the rest of our panelists can chime in. Um, but Carl, the, the question is, what possible future improvements in satellite technology would be substantially beneficial to National Weather Service operations? Yeah, so uh, there's one obvious uh, one that I think that a lot of people are starting to pick up on is the uh, uh, the inclusion of, of using computers to kind of help draw out the features for us. You know, in this um, in this day and age where we're starting to get 
more and more satellite data that needs uh, processing or interpreting. Um, and, uh, you know, we can't, as humans, uh, or as forecasters especially, uh, as operational forecasters, it's very difficult to sift through the, the plethora of, um, of images and, and data to, to pull out the, the, the features of interest, you know. Um, so using uh, computer algorithms or uh, that machine learning to help um, pick out, uh, you know, the things that might repeat themselves uh, or, you know, features of interest that, uh, you know, might aid in our operational workflow, that, that seems to be a really uh, new and emerging technology that I'm really excited about to see how that is going to, um, uh, you know, aid us in, in, in an operational sense. Um, and so I think that would be uh, a technology um, that, that would be uh, very substantially helpful to us is, is the, uh, the inclusion of um, computers to help aid in our operational workflow. Um, the, thinking more of like, a, I don't know, if, if we're opening this up to maybe a more sci-fi kind of world, if there's any sort of like, uh, you know, new capabilities, say if we were to find some some special moon rocks or something like that, we were, that we were able to sample different areas of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and that we weren't capable of doing before, you know, it's, it's always interesting to hear how other areas and uh, that how other technologies and different industries can can work their way over into um, I don't know meteorology uh, specifically I guess um, but uh, it, and there always seems to be uh, you know a better resolution um, spectrally spatially and temporally um, has a track record of of bringing increased uh, you know benefits to to operational um, meteorology. But again, you know, as we start to increase that data, uh, it's it's just becoming too much, or it, it seems to be uh, getting to be too much information for just uh, one person to look at and sift through and make uh, actionable, um, you know, decisions on that. Yeah, that's that's always an issue, right? Thank you. Um, I know it a little bit uh, related with this question, and it's um, it, it comes from Gyan from from our audience, and it's also directed towards National Weather Service. Um, and the question is, what are the top two or three algorithms slash products uh, that are critical for National Weather Service to predict the day-to-day -day weather? That is a tough question to answer. <laughs> um, that is a tough question. You know, each day presents different um, different hazards, different challenges. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to say what product or algorithm is going to uh, you know reign superior above them all on a day to day basis. Um, you know, there we had mentioned some of the the fusion products that come from uh, LEO and GEO uh, satellites um, that cover uh, anywhere from, you know, uh, flooding to, to fires um, to, to volcanic ash uh, plume uh, monitoring. Um, you know, even just something as simple as fog monitoring, there, there are some uh, products and, and algorithms that, uh, that are provided to us that we could use to, to really help um, uh, monitor uh, fog uh, detection in, in order for us to, you know, to make assessments as to where maybe, um, you know, most decreased visibility can be. That can be a, a, a very large um, hazard. And, and, you know, there are some industries that are very vulnerable to that and that, you know, partners kind of wanted to know that. Um, it, so it's, it's, it's hard to say any one particular um, product that is out there right now uh, that can be beneficial, but it, it, it just depends on, um, you know, what, what you're trying to look for that day and what problem presents itself um, for that day. Very good. Thank you. 
And you know, while we you were answering, we did get a um, a bill did send a, a note in here, not a question, but just saying NWP models are critical and satellite data is assimilated into these models. Carl, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, that was, you know, um, I mentioned that uh, kind of here in the beginning and, and, and Joral touched on that in his, uh, um, in, in his presentation, um, this, in an area where we might think we have like a lot of data in terms of coverage, in terms of you know, uh, you know, whether surveillance radars that we have the network around uh, the United States, or even just the surface observations or upper air observations that are that are around, there's still a lot of data gaps, um, both spatially and temporally, um, and satellites that that really expansive. Uh, field of view that it covers over uh, much of the world now um, really helps fill in those data gaps and that's what the you know the, the numerical weather prediction models um, they build upon you know it's kind of how they start they, you know um, the the better way that we can assess the current state of the atmosphere um, the better we can create a forecast for the forecast state of the atmosphere Thank you so much, Carl. And, uh, you know, we got another really interesting question here, and I think I'm going to um, throw it to Mike. And the, the question is, how does AI, artificial intelligence technology, play into the work you do using satellite imagery? Yeah, this is a good question. So, it, it, and it follows on to something that Carl mentioned about overload. Right. I mean, this the, the amount of environmental data, not just from satellites that we're getting, but from all other sources combined as well, is it's just it's incredible. Um, so just 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 take low Earth orbit LEO and GEO satellites. Those operated by NOAA and our international partners. Every single day, those satellites provide over one trillion Earth observations. That's about five times more observations than just about five years ago. And, and that's continuing to grow. So I, I would argue that automation and AI are, are not just sort of a, a value add or a luxury, they're, they're a necessity um, in order to, to really capitalize on, on all of these observations. So, you know, AI, it can, it can automate the extraction of human-like insights. That doesn't mean that you take the human completely out of the loop for a lot of these problems. Humans still have a, a unique um, they have unique capabilities that are really hard to, to replicate across the board uh, by machines, but the machines can do a lot more of the heavy lifting, freeing up the humans to do the things that humans really uniquely do well, like communication with partners, com you know, that type of thing that you can't, you can't outsource to a machine. Um, the other thing that machine learning and, and artificial intelligence can do is not just give you an idea of what's going on right now by looking at like satellite data as it comes in, but projecting it forward in time. So we talked about numerical weather prediction and models. That's one tool we have for looking at the future. Another tool is actually taking observations, and a lot of them come from satellite, and, and, and using machine learning to predict something that's going to happen in the future. So knowing what's happening now is really powerful. Knowing what's going to happen in the future is even more powerful. And AI really does enable some of that for things like severe weather um, applications like imagine knowing what the lightning threat is going to be in advance of the storm even showing up on your radar. You know, that's something that AI is, is starting to deliver. Um, being able to predict where heavy precipitation is going to fall, that's something AI is starting to deliver on. Um, so these, these, it really is, I mean, the, 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 the progress on this is coming fast and furious. And, and I think, you know, that, that pace is not going to slow anytime soon. Very good. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, about And, you know, I want to just open it up to our previous presenters, to Dan and to Jorel, to see if they have any thoughts on AI, on artificial intelligence applications to satellite data. Hi, this is Dan. I'll just say that I completely agree with Mike um, and Carl, you know, bringing up this point of letting the machines do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, we have a number of research projects ongoing now um, looking at this and sort of testing out some potential AI methods for improving some of the various products and services that we're that we're providing. 
And uh, I, I think this uh, is v extremely promising because of the power of the of the fast computing that the uh, the computers are able to do. So um, definitely a thing of the future. Um, it's a thing of the current, but it's going to become even more so of the future moving forward and, and really improve things. Thank you. Dan. And as Dan and Mike were mentioning, uh, yeah, and as Dan were, and Mike were mentioning, you know, with, with AI and all of the current research that's going on and then the future, it's, it, it will be really interesting to see um, uh, where we go with all that AI research and the improvement of our products and algorithms, uh, whether it be from the LEO and or GEO sides. Thank you, Jarrell. And you know, Jarrell, since since uh, since uh, I have you on, if you may, since you're the last one to talk, I don't know. We did get this question from the audience, but I do not know if um, you have an answer for this. But he asks, how does the radio occultation data sets uh, uh, helping better predictability for NOAA? Yeah, with that one, I'm not as sure maybe the others can chime in but uh but i'll say from the leo perspective um as we mentioned earlier and then as i mentioned in my previous talk two weeks ago with the polar orbiting data sets um it's about 85 percent of that data goes into the global weather models to help improve those forecast models and that's a significant chunk of data sets and you know we're also going to be looking forward to jpss too which will be launching as of right now, tentatively scheduled for September of next year, which then will add to the uh, international um, uh, constellation of uh, LEO satellites that will help further improve those data sets. Uh, so we look forward to that um, as well. But but in regard to specific radio occult occultation data sets, um, I'll, I'll let the others chime in there if, if they can. Uh, this is Dan. I, I don't, I'm not an expert on radio occultation. I, I, I think what's happening is that we are taking those data sets, those radio occultation data sets, and feeding them into our the numerical models at NOAA to improve the initial state, similar to the way we're feeding in the LEO data and we're feeding in some information from the GEO data. But again, I, I'm not 100% certain since I don't work specifically on, on those data sets. Fair enough. Um, we got an interesting question here, and and then I think I'm gonna send it to you. It's um, what is the reason that geo satellites only cover the U.S.? Is it a political, diplomatic reason, economic? Thank you. Okay, so I, I do like that question. Um, so the the U.S. geo satellites we have goes east and goes west. Um, they cover the. Um, anywhere really the the extent is is quite large um they cover a full disc which means nearly an entire hemisphere so if you combine the coverage of east and west we go from basically the west coast of africa all the way over to new zealand um and that's um you know probably half of the globe if not more i'm not sure if it's if that is the entire half but um what's what's really nice is that we have an excellent relationship with many of our international partners so for example uh, japan the, the J Japan Meteorological Agency, JMA, they have a geosatellite known as Himawari 8, which is centered over the West Pacific Ocean. They share that data with us, and the National Weather Service uses the Himawari data from Japan in real time. Similarly, uh, Europe, there's a group in, at Europe called UMETSAT that um, a lot of the countries over there contribute to. Um, they have their own geosatellites. One is centered at the prime meridian at zero degrees longitude, and then they have another one centered over about 40 degrees east looking at the uh, Indian Ocean region. So if you take all of these five different satellites that I've talked about, it really does provide a global picture. So it's not it's, it's really a, a good example of international collaboration among these meteorological agencies of, uh, you know, sharing the geo data to help each other out. That was great. Thank you. And the one the last question that I have here right now, and I did want to thank Juan Pablo for that previous question. That was very good. Um, I'm going to send this question to both Michael and Carl. Um, the question is, are there different times in the year when you use more of one satellite data over the other? Uh, 
So I'll take take a first stab. Um, I, I'm not an operational user, um, but 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 for me, no, not 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 really. Um, you know, because we are fortunate that the energy that these satellites measure spans you know a pretty wide range. So even in the absence of sunlight, we're getting very valuable information. So at night, you know, um, you know during the winter when there's less sunlight, you know, we're st we're still getting really valuable information that serves a whole variety of applications. Um, but you know that, that that's from the researcher's point of view. So it'd be good to hear what what Carl has to say from the, the operational point of view. Yeah. So as a from a platform standpoint, or even just an orbital standpoint, I wouldn't say there's really uh, favoring or seasonal favoring um, so much. Uh, but within uh, the actual uh, instruments themselves, and mainly within uh, um, the spectral. Um, portion of the, uh, you know, the instrument or just the, the sensing capability. Yeah, there, there are uh, some um, different uh, bands, if you will, or different areas within uh, the spectral sensing um, capabilities that uh, we kind of favor, uh, or at least have a difference in seasonal, cap uh, you know, capabilities. Um, Mike alluded to, you know, the lack of sunlight. So in the winter time, um, depending on what, uh, you know, what part of the globe you are on, if, uh, if you start losing daylight, then um, you know, at least more, uh, more so, and then compared to the other season, then you start losing uh, the capability of um, the imaging capability that requires that daylight. Um, so, for instance, uh, for just using um, the the ABI, for instance, on the the, the current uh, operational um, geo satellites, um, that's like five bands. I think that's you know that might have some limited um, capability uh, as comparing winter time to to, to summer time, um, and so you would start relying maybe more on um, other spectral bands that don't need, uh, for instance, that that daylight. Um, and uh, the the different combinations probably this is this is probably more so where it's it's most noticeable is um, the combination of uh, the way that you can display these these bands in, in a certain way to help draw the features that you're looking for that prob probably shows the most um, seasonal dependence. Um, for instance, you know there there are certain um, combinations of bands um, the, that are known as RGBs. Uh, that would be, um, you know, best for detecting snow or the, you know, different winter time applications. You know, you're probably not going to be using that a whole lot during the summertime. Um, as well as, the, you know, if you're in an area that has a very large seasonal dependence on uh, severe weather applications, then there are certain RGBs and certain image combinations and, and even products that uh, are very, uh, you know, attuned to that. So if you're don't have any severe weather, you're not going to be really looking at that, um, you know, potentially for a whole entire season. Um, so that I would say, you know, maybe not so much in terms of the uh, the orbital um, platforms themselves, but within uh, the actual, uh, you know, the spectral type regions um, or spectral applications. And yeah, there there is a seasonal dependence. That makes total sense. Thank you. And, you know, that was the last question. Oh, wait, another one came in. Uh, so this is kind of like a long question. <laughs> uh, so I will, tr I'm trying to see if I can shorten it a little bit and see, because it just came in, I apologize. I was kind of like going to be ready to wrap up uh, since we're at the top of the hour, but... Um, so this, I'm, I'm just going to read it out, and I'm going to let uh, any of you jump in to see if you want to say anything, because it's, it's kind of long. It says, a lot of information from Dr. Rick Spinrad's recent All Hands to NOAA involved climate change, climate monitoring. What satellites are being planned that NOAA will ingest that will collect data that will help us track sea level rise, greenhouse gases, and other climate-related issues. 
are there new satellite instruments that should be considered? Does anybody want to maybe tackle this one in a minute before we close up? And talk about how our satellites actually do have a full climate record from all our observations over the past decades? Hi, th this is Dan. I can chime in a little bit on this. So yeah, as you say, Rafa, um, our current satellites do collect some information which is very useful for, for a climate. Um, one example is clouds. You, you may not think about clouds as being that much of a of a climate issue, but it, they actually are. They, you know, clouds serve the purpose of um, both reflecting incoming solar radiation as well as absorbing out, out, outgoing long wave. So if you get changes in clouds over long periods of time, say over decadal time scales, that can in turn affect the climate in various uh, positive and negative ways. Um, in terms of, uh, and there are, that's just one example. There, we have a number of other instruments that are collecting data and feeding into um, sort of what we call climate data records and something that we're able to track over long periods of time. In terms of future sensors, there are discussions now on what we will be flying in the future, say in the 2030s and beyond. Um, nothing is set in stone yet. It's all sort of up in the air. I, I will say one instrument that we're excited about on the geo side um, as part of a new program called GeoExo or Geostationary Extended Observations is, is something called an atmospheric composition sensor. And this one measures uh, some aspects of atmospheric composition. Um, you know, we, we can't necessarily do everything from geo, uh, but in, in terms of things like carbon retrievals, but I think if you combine the NOAA information from the NOAA satellites with lots of satellites from NASA that NASA is flying now and in the future, you get a really good picture of, of the climate. And I think that, that those data sets work, work really well for, um, I guess, uh, keep, keeping track of climate change and, you know, preparing for the future. And in addition to that, just from the Leo perspective, oh, sorry, Rafa. Um, in addition to that, from the Leo side, um, with uh, NOAA 20 or JPSS-1, you have the, uh, one of the five instruments on board is the uh, ozone mapping and profiler suite that helps measure your ozone concentrations around, uh, around the globe. So we'll also be looking forward to more data sets from JPSS-2, which will be launching next year as well to add, to, so, uh, to add more measurements involving greenhouse gases, specifically with ozone. So I just wanted to mention that as well. That's awesome. No, and, and that's great. And I think that is a good full circle of, uh, you know, all the applications and all the different things that, that we've been talking about here. And I, I, I want to thank our panelists for participating in this. I just want to open it up to see if anybody has any final last words before we close down. Nothing heard? Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to our audience for for joining us in these Ned talks, and uh, you know this uh, is recording is going to be made available on the uh, Ned talks archive. Again, that link is in the bottom left corner of your screen, and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us via at NOAA Satellites if you have any questions or or for our panelists or for us. So again, thank you everybody and have a wonderful rest of your day.